Hi everyone, I'm Zarek Lassen, software engineer at Collabora. Today I'm going to present a quick introduction to Mesa build system and how it can be used to shrink the size of a GST module. Let's start with a quick introduction to Mesa, uh, its syntax and uh, how it's used. First, what is Mesa? It's a build system that runs on multiple platforms, including Linux, macOS, and Windows. It can uh, also use a Visual Studio. It's, uh, it supports multiple languages like C, C++. Um, it is written in Python 3. And um, yeah, it supports cross compilation, so you can uh, cross compile your project for an embedded device or Android device or anything. Um, it's user friendly. The syntax is really easy to understand and read. And um, last but not least, it's fast. Uh, so the one of the main goal is really to have a fast build system. And to do that, uh, Mason generates a Ninja uh, uh, build instructions. Uh, Ninja is really fast to uh, compile all the, the project and only recompile the parts that needed. Let's start with a really simple example that defines uh, a, a library. So first of all, you you put uh, your build definition in a meson.build file at the top of your source tree. In that file, you start by uh, declaring the project, uh, giving its name, the language uh, used. In this example, it's a, a, C, a, a C library. Um, you define the version of your project, the Mason version required, and, uh, and so forth. Um, to build a library, you first need to declare uh, the source files needed to, to compile the library. Um, Mason does not support uh, globbing, so start.c, for example. Um, that's uh, for performance uh, reason. So you have to list all the files you uh, needed for, for your library or any target. Um, then you can uh, build the library, give it a name, give the source files, and uh, install that library and, uh, and uh, install the header files of the library. To compile the library, um, the command is, uh, so first you have to configure the project. To configure the project, you run Mason setup and give it a build directory. It's going to do an out of source tree that, uh, build. That means that Mason is not going to create any file inside the source tree, but put everything inside the dedicated uh, directory. Um, it build, by default, it's going to build a shared library, um, but we'll see later how we can use, uh, we can uh, build a static library or even both. Uh, for the compilation step, uh, it uses Ninja. So Mason only generates a Ninja file, and then Ninja is going to execute the compilation. So as I said, uh, Mason supports building shared library, static library, and even both at the same time. Uh, to control that, by default, it's going to, to build shared library, but you have dash dash default library equal, and then you can give it uh, both or just static. If you do both, it uh, Mason as a, will uh, compile, as you can see here, the source file, both for the C and C++ source files are written in once uh, for both the static uh, here and the shared library here. So um, that's a trick um, that saves a lot of, uh, of build time. Um, it has uh, some limitations, like for example, uh, on, that it cannot be used on Windows. Let's see how Mason supports cross compilation next. To cross compile, you have to define a cross file. A cross file is a, a basically an ini file that um, defines the, the tool chain and the, the target machine. In that that uh, ini file supports some special syntax that helps you maintain a, a readable. Um, uh, readable settings. Like for example, here you can see that 
we can define some constants uh, with the path to go for example the Android NDK um, you installed on your system and you can use that constant and use the slash operator to, to concat a path uh, so in, in this case we don't have to repeat the path to NDK we can already we can define another constant the name it tool chain here and it's going to um, concat both paths and those constants can be used inside the rest of your file here and here so you don't have to repeat the full path to your um, tool chain so as you can see here he, we define a, a sys route where the compiler is going to find header files and uh, and libraries and here we can we define the C, C++ and a few binaries uh, needed to compile Um, now that we have uh, written that file, uh, we can pass it to the Mesen setup uh, command line with dash dash cross file. And as you can see, uh, it's going to use the, 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 the CLN compiler from the uh, Android NDK to compile the, our small example project. Uh, as before, we, uh, so Mesen does the setup the, the configuration part and then Ninja does the build and um, as you can see the example um, that SO the shared library is uh, built is cross built for Arma, uh, Arma architecture now every um, C and C++ project uh, needs external dependency let's see how Mason support that um, Mesen has a, the dependency uh, method. Um, it's really straightforward. You pass uh, the name of your dependency and Mesen is going to look up on your system uh, if it can find it. Uh, to find the dependency, Mesen uses uh, mostly PTG config or CMake. Um, as you can see in this example, uh, we, we look for the libxml uh, dependency, external dependency, and pass it to uh, build our library. So now the, the la our library can depend and be linked on the uh, libxml. Unfortunately, especially when we cross compile, most of the time the dependencies are not found on the system. Because of course, when, if you cross compile on Linux for Android, um, you cannot link on libxml from your system. You have to provide all the dependency already built um uh, for Android. Most of the time people uh, use a meta build system for that, but Mesan has a has a, a really uh, special way of handling that for you. Um, Mesan has something called sub project. A sub project is um, a dependency you can have on a, another project and Mesan will build it together with your project. So let's say you have an application that needs a, that needs a dependency example um, to build the, the application. You can uh, give to your application a, a file named subproject slash example uh, dot wrap. And there you define where to download uh, the source code of that dependency and which dependency names it provides. So here it, uh, we, it provides the example dependency. Uh, that means that whenever Mesan look up for the example dependency and cannot find it on the system, it's automatically going to do a do git clone the, the, the project from GitHub and configure it as part of your project and link it together all transparently for you. Here is an example. Here, yeah, you can see the, the lib example we had previously, but we added a few things there to be used as a subproject for the application. So we declare a dependency. <clears throat> so we say that to use uh, our lib example, we need to link, link to, li the, to lib example and we need the include directory to the current directory, so the top source tree of that subproject. And we can even generate a PKG config file. You can see that 
really is simple because Mesa knows all the flags, C flags and the linker flags needed uh, inside that PKG config file. So you can just ask to generate one and it's, uh, it's going to be done automatically. <clears throat> now, it's really, uh, it's complicated to, to maintain a list of all your dependency wrap files like that. So you need the, the location of every dependency and that's complicated. And Mesan has something called wrapdb. You can uh, go and look at it on wrapdb.mesanbuild.com. That's a collection of wrap files. That's basically just a collection of wrap files for all the, the, the every project we know uh, that uh, support Mesan build system either as an upstream uh, build system or some of them are supported by the Mesan project itself. So we have a Mesan port of, for example, here, LibXML2. We have a Mesan port maintained by the Mesan team. And uh, if you use, if you fetch that wrap file from wrapdb, um, you're going to it's going to download and configure libxml uh, for you on your project so you don't have to, uh, to, to build it separately. And that system can go wild. So GStreamer in particular has uh, many, many, many sub-projects. You can see here the list. It's uh, over 40 sub-projects that can be used. And um, together, that means that GStreamer can be built uh, completely uh, without any uh, dependency from uh, your system. Um, when I say completely, uh, some of the features are missing, so some dependencies are missing, but every um, hard dependency are uh, provided by a, a Mesenza project, um, even more than, even a lot of uh, optional dependencies. Let's dive in now how we build the G streamer. Um, in our presentation now, we are, we are going to see how we can cross compile, for example, G streamer for the Android platform using the Android NDK and see how we can go from, an, uh, from a build that takes, if you enable all the features of G streamer, the build takes about uh, 150 megabytes and we'll we'll see a few tricks that can um, strip down that uh, that size to something really small uh, that can fit embedded devices so if um, if you build by default you just uh, provide meson the cross file that uh, it's already provided in the gstreamer project you have you have the cross file already um, already there you just have to edit that file to um, change the path where you installed your Android NDK on your system. If you just a simple command like that, no option, it's going to configure over 40 sub project by default. So you're going to have Cairo, FreeType 2, LibSoup, and so forth. And that's going to make a really huge uh, build, uh, as I said, over uh, 150 megabytes. Um, fortunately, GStreamer has a has a feature option for every single uh, plugin it has. So how it works? A feature option here we, we see the let's see, we see the option, the example with the Opus uh, plugin. Yeah, so GStreamer has plugins for every features it has. So a pl so every plugin can be built separately, and we can enable some plugins or not. Um, the, the goal when you do a small build is to only enable the plugins you actually need in your applications and skip everything that you don't need. Um, so yeah, as you can see, we can declare the Opus option, uh, set it a type of features. A feature has uh, three possible, possible uh, values. It's uh, either auto, enabled, or disabled. Um, Enable and disable are pretty straightforward. It means that we have to uh, to build with the, the Opus plugin. Uh, disable it means we don't build the, the Opus uh, plugin. And auto means that we build the, the, the plugin only if the dependency is found on your system or if a sub project can provide that, uh, that dependency. 
So you can see here when we look up for the opus dependency, we said it is required and we get the opus option. That means that if the opus option is set to disabled, for example, it's go it's going to always return not found. And if it's not found, then the plugin is not built. If it's set to auto, um, Mezan is going to look up for an, a sub-project that provides uh, the opus external dependency and build that sub-project. Um, so in our case, we want to disable all, all those features, uh, features option uh, for everything we don't need um, in, a, in an Android application. Uh, doing it one, doing, um, Disabling every feature one by one is going to be really difficult because there are a lot of options like that um, and you have to know them all. Um, but Mason has a trick. Um, by default, every option in GStreamer is set to auto, but Mason has a special option called auto features. Um, that option sets can, uh, can switch all the Free, all features that has uh, the value is set to auto, it can switch them all at once, uh, either to disabled or enabled. And in our case, we want to disable everything. So with that uh, command line option, you can pass to Mason configure. Uh, it's going to disable every plugin in GStreamer and you are going to have basically a, a, an empty build. Uh, now, of course, we need to enable a few of them, those that we know that we need for our, uh, our application. And those can be enabled one by one after we disabled everything by default. So here, we, here is uh, an example command line uh, to make the, the smallest builds uh, possible for Android. Um, I mean, the, the, the less plugins possible. Um, so as you can see, you can pass, you, you first pass the cross file, you disable every features, and then you enable the few that you actually need. Uh, for a useful uh, Android build, here we, have, we need Android media plugin. That one is, uh, provides the Android codecs. It uses Android internal API for supporting all the codecs. And itself, it also uh, requires a GL support uh, in GStreamer. So those options here just says that we, we want, we disable everything except for um, GL support and Android uh, codex plugin. And when you do that, you can see that um, the sub-projects enabled uh, during your build are really small. Most of them are just disabled and only the art dependency or those that you are enabled um, are actually built. So it, you can see here, it's going to build glib because uh, glib is a hard dependency of the streamer. And it also, you can see it builds nothing else. Yeah, except PCR, uh, uh, it, that, that one is a, a dependency of glib. So when you do that build, uh, install that inside a, a desk deer. Uh, you can see that it takes about 48 megabytes when I did the try on my laptop. It can, it can change a bit, but uh, depending on which version of the GStreamer you have, but yeah, not, uh, uh, of course, here I did the, the, the try on, uh, on GStreamer main branch. So let's see how we can train that 48 megabytes uh, down um, as much as possible, but that's already a good start because as I said, a full build is over 100 megabytes. So that's already a, a good start. Um, the first step of course is we can skip all the files we don't need uh, at runtime. So all the header files, PKG config files, um, static libraries, if there is any, uh, all those are not needed when you are actually running the application. So um, to do that, Mason has um, a nice um, command line. Uh, you can pass to Mason install, you can pass dash dash tag uh, runtime. And 
that's going to inst to install only the files the the targets that are tagged as a, 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 a runtime target so runtime targets are bit, are most of the time they are um, uh, shared libraries executables uh, uh, yeah that's that's basically the only thing we have in this uh, context so when you do that you see you're already down to uh, 40 megabytes so that's eight megabytes already just for useless files that we, we remove Uh, next step, obviously, is to strip the binaries. Um, Mesen uh, install support the dash dash strip command line, and that's that's actually uh, that's divided by four the size of the of your libraries. Thus, you are down to eleven megabytes. That's going that's, that's starting to look good. The next step is doing a static build. Because static builds uh, allows the linker to do a lot of optimization. Uh, it, the linker is going to drop all the code that is not actually used uh, for that build. To build, um, to make a static build with uh, Mesen, you have the option dash dash default library equals stat static. So every uh, library. Uh, Mason is going to build instead of building the shell library, it's going to be a static library instead. Um, as you can see, when I did the, that uh, that build, uh, the the lib uh, directory is uh, went from eleven megabytes down to five megabytes. So it's half of the size, just because we static linked everything together. Um, when I say static link, it's going to static link for GStreamer, all the GStreamer libraries, all GStreamer um, plugins, but also all the dependency that we built as sub-projects. As you can see in this example, compared to the previous one, the GStreamer-10 uh, directory is gone. That directory is where plugins are usually installed. And um, why is that, that, uh, is that gone? Well, as I said, it is going to um, static link everything uh, together. So the plugins are not shared library anymore. They are static link inside what we call libgstreamer full. So that's a single shared library uh, specific to gstreamer that um, includes gstreamer, all the gstreamer libraries and their dependencies, but also all the plugins. <coughs> Plugins are automatically initialized when you do GST in it, so you don't have to um, to worry about uh, any uh, any plugin. Uh, it's all uh, done. Uh, it's all done transparently. It's just like if GStreamer had no plugin system at all uh, from there. Um, so that shared library actually exposes an ABI. In that API, you will have all the symbols from glib and gobject and libgstreamer. So with that API, you can now build an applications that use gstreamer and glib uh, because glib, of course, it's required to, to, to write any gstreamer application. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so as you can see, uh, we were we we were already at five megabytes, and when uh, so yeah, so, uh, so that shared library is about five dot two megabytes. Uh, that's uh, already a really good. Uh, we we shrinked GStreamer uh, quite a lot already. So a few extra options that can uh, shrink even even more your build. Obviously, you want to disable the debug. So we have dash d debug equal false. You want to, op to optimize uh, for size. Uh, the optimization that that's the flight path to GCC or C line, um, they can optimize the code for speed or size. And in some specific cases, you want to uh, optimize for size. Uh, for the case where every byte counts, uh, if you want to fit GStreamer on a smartwatch, every byte uh, counts, so that's useful. Um, and then you can also but uh, disable uh, glib uh, as certain checks. Those are macros that um, checks at runtime 
if the instance of the object are valid or not, and you can disable those checks. Um, but give a little bit of runtime speed up and also shrink a little bit the, the binary size. Um, <clears throat> I would not recommend that um, during development at all, uh, but for the production products, uh, once you have really uh, stabilized your application, that's a, a little trick you can use as well. Um, currently, there is a small glitch between the GStreamer option and the GLib option. As you can see, you have to duplicate them here. That's simply because GStreamer uses a dash while uh, GLib uses an underscore. Um, that difference mean, means that, uh, that Mason uh, does not recognize those options as being the same. Otherwise, the two first would be enough. Um, there is a, a merge request I made uh, for GStreamer to, to um, uniformize the, 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 the option name, uh, but it's not merged yet. As you can see now, we are down, down to a, a little bit over 4 uh, megabytes. Now let's uh, see a few little experimental tricks that can help you uh, shrink it even further. Um, those are more um, advanced and you don't always need them. Um, one trick I did uh, for an, uh, an old project is to uh, strip uh, parts of the EBI we have uh, from GLib. Um, for that, you can pass a, a LD version script. Um, we have an example here. And in, so every, uh, the GStream of full lab, shared library is going to expose every public symbol from glib and gobject. And that means that when a symbol is exposed, even if your application does not use that symbol, all the code in the binary uh, related to that symbol uh, is included inside your um, your shell library. Um, but if you if you use that script, it says that some of those symbols are actually local, so that means they are private, and they are not exposed. That means that the linker can then strip them out of the, the binary if they are not used internally by that, uh, by that uh, library. And um, a few of glibs uh, API are not used by GStreamer itself, so we can hide them and that save a, a few uh, a few bytes in your binary. Uh, this is just an example. Of course, you can uh, trick that with more symbols, or but make sure that you your application is not using them. Otherwise, that's going to be a linker error. And the final trick uh, we have, um, yeah, so uh, glib has Unicode support uh, for UTF-8. Um, that uh, Unicode support um, includes a huge Unicode tables. That's over a megabyte of tables uh, included inside the glib binary. Um, most of the time, uh, devices already have libICU. That's a really popular uh, C++ library that does all the same uh, Unicode um, operations and includes the same tables. So you end up with a duplicated uh, data there. Uh, uh, if you are really constrained in, the bin in binary size, you want to, uh, to drop the, um, the tables from glib and use those from uh, libicu. Um, <clears throat> We did uh, with uh, a collaborator colleague uh, did uh, a merge request, merge request on glib to optionally use libicu in glib uh, instead of glib as internal uh, implementation for Unicode. Um, but can it be, if you uh, use that merge request from glib and you have a new option where you can set um, to use the libicu Unicode implementation instead of glib, it's not going to drop all the, the Unicode tables and related codes from the glib binary and save over a megabyte. Um, unfortunately, um, 
that uh, merge request need a little bit, little bit of work, so it's not working anymore. So I don't have the numbers, the exact numbers, when I did my presentation. Um, but um, if anyone is uh, is interested, uh, help is welcome here. Uh, that's it for me today. Um, hope uh, you learned something, and. Um, uh, by the way, we, we are working at Collabora and we are in. So uh, if you have uh, you are interested in working in open source and uh, cool projects, uh, please uh, send us uh, an email. Thank you.